This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. One of President Biden's first steps in his first week in office was to end the Trump ban on transgender people serving in the U.S. military and issue an executive order to clarify protections for trans people in the workplace, schools, in health care, and more. He also signed four executive orders to advance what the White House calls his racial equity agenda. The moves are steps on the long path toward equality, and today we spend the hour looking back on one of the most pivotal figures in the history of this struggle, Pauli Murray, a trailblazing black, queer, feminist, poet, lawyer and legal scholar and priest who was discriminated against from childhood because of their race or gender or both, and went on to question systems of oppression and conformity with a radical vision ahead of their time that influenced landmark civil rights decisions and gender equality legislation that transformed our world. As a civil rights pioneer, Pauli Murray was arrested 15 years before Rosa Parks for refusing to give up a seat on a bus. Pauli later helped found the National Organization for Women. Pauli also became a priest and is now a saint in the Episcopal Church. Pauli Murray's story is told in a new documentary premiering at the Sundance Film Festival that opens this weekend, that features never-before-seen footage and audio recordings of Pauli Murray in their own words. Can I take some uh, close-ups of you without your glasses? Mm-hmm. Lie down. Sit down. Lie down. Lie down. <laughs> he has to be in everything. My name is Pauli Murray, and my field of concentration has been human rights. My whole personal history has been a struggle to meet standards of excellence in a society which has been dominated by the ideas that blacks were inherently inferior to whites and women were inherently inferior to men. How influential was Pauli Murray in the fight for equality? They played a key role in developing Thurgood Marshall's arguments that led to the unanimous 1954 Supreme Court ruling in Brown v. Board of Education that racial segregation of children in public schools was unconstitutional. And they inspired Ruth Bader Ginsburg's first argument before the Supreme Court as a lawyer that the Equal Protection Clause that made it illegal to discriminate on the basis of race also made it illegal to discriminate on the basis of sex, a practice Pauli Murray called Jane Crow. Pauli Murray inspired so many people, yet their experience as a non-binary black person has often been overlooked. Their role in all of these histories has been overlooked. In a letter to their aunt Pauline in 1943, Pauli Murray wrote, I don't know whether I'm right or whether society or some medical authority is right, I only know that how I feel and what makes me happy. This conflict rises up to knock me down at every apex I reach in my career. And because the laws of society do not protect me, I'm exposed to any enemy or person who may or may not want to hurt me," they wrote. In the new documentary, I Am Pauli Murray, trans activist and writer Raquel Wellis and queer and trans writer Dolores Chandler share how Pauli Murray is also a hero to many in today's trans rights movement. As a trans, gender nonconforming, queer person of mixed race myself, I thought, "Mm, this is a feeling I know well. We've been taught to believe that people like us don't exist. So when I came to know and learn about Polly Murray, I was so amazed and wanted to like hold it so tightly. And also I was angry. I was so angry that I felt in some ways that I had been robbed of a part of my history. I 
I identify with the turmoil of someone who was trying to live life as a complete being with an integrated body, mind, and spirit. If Polly Murray were sitting here today and I said, you know, Polly, what, what pronouns do you use? I don't know what Polly Murray would, would say. Being black and queer myself, I refer to Polly as they or simply Polly to acknowledge their expansive gender experience. That's Raquel Willis and Dolores Chandler in the new film My Name is Polly Murray. Dolores is the former coordinator of the Polly Murray Center and joins us now from Durham, North Carolina. We're also joined by the film's directors and producers, Julie Cohen and Betsy West. The film grew out of their Academy Award-nominated documentary, RBG. I Am Polly Murray is premiering at the Sundance Film Festival, one of the premier film festivals in the world, which has just started and is taking place, well, mostly online due to the pandemic. We welcome you all to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us. Um, Betsy West, I wanted to begin with you. Talk about how you learned about Pauli Murray and the trajectory that this film has taken following your critically acclaimed film, RBG. Well, uh, we learned about Pauli Murray from RBG. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, RBG credited Pauli Murray with ideas about using the 14th Amendment to win equal rights for women. And in fact, RBG put Pauli Murray's name on the cover of the first brief that she wrote before the Supreme Court in Reed v. Reed. So, you know, Julie and I heard the name and learned a little bit. But after the documentary RBG was finished, we started to do a little more investigating. And it didn't take long to realize that this chapter in Polly's life was just one of an extraordinary series of events. And uh, we just thought, well, first of all, like, wow, why didn't we know about Polly Murray? And uh, what an amazing story. And would it be possible to make a documentary about Polly? I actually wanted to go to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, shortly after the Supreme Court justice, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, died last year, Time magazine published a never-before-seen interview with RBG from 2017 talking about how Pauli Murray influenced her. The 14th Amendment contains my favorite clause of the Constitution, nor shall any state deny any person the equal protection of the laws. Paulie had the idea that we should interpret the text literally. It said any person, not any male person. She wrote this remarkable article called Jane Crow and the Law where she called attention to all the laws that restricted what women could do. Read Me Read was the turning point gender discrimination case in the Supreme Court. I wrote the brief in Sally Reed's case. I put on the cover Paulie Murray's name. By the time of Reed, Paulie had already changed her interest. She was going to divinity school. She was into ministry, not lawyering. But we knew when we were writing that brief that we were standing on her shoulders. Yes, that's none other than Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, speaking to the filmmakers Margot Guernsey and Llewellyn Smith back in 2017. RBG is also featured, and my name is Polly Murray. So, Julie Cohen, if you can take us back, I mean, what is astounding about this, and I'm sure for many around the world who are watching or listening to this or reading about it right now, is this is the first time they are hearing Polly Murray's name, yet named uh, by RBG as one of her inspirations, and then go back in time to Thurgood Marshall and before that as well. 
That, yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, certainly there is a growing awareness among uh, progressives in the U.S., um, Episcopal, Episcopals, people who live in Durham, North Carolina, you know, uh, uh, pockets of, of extreme interest and academics who are interested in Pauli Murray. But the fact is, most of us uh, were not taught about Pauli Murray in our elementary school history classes, as perhaps we should have been, or, or later in, in our schooling. And yet, this is a person who influenced so many different movements in the U.S., not only, as you were talking about, the fight for gender equality, but also the fight for racial equality. When Pauli Murray was at Howard Law School in the early 1940s, Pauli wrote a paper uh, making the argument that Plessy versus Ferguson should be overturned uh, that 1896, the notorious 1896 Supreme Court case uh, laying down the rule of separate but equal. Um, the feeling of the early civil rights movement at that point was what we should be fighting for in the separate but equal realm is to sort of, you know, improve the conditions in segregated institutions. Pauli Murray's argument was, no, 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 this whole construct is faulty. Separate but equal, by definition, is unfair. And by keeping people separate, you are treating them unequally. You're creating a, a stamp or a badge of inferiority, tell, telling people that you you have to, you know, people need to be going to their own corners. Uh, Pauli's uh, t teachers and uh, classmates at Howard Law School thought this idea too, too radical. In Pauli's description, um, there was laughter and mocking. Um, Pauli said, I think that Plessy is going to be overturned. Uh, I think within 25 years was Pauli's guess. Uh, one, of her, one of Pauli's professors um, made, made a $10 wager saying, like, no, absolutely no way. Of course, 10 years later, 1954, uh, the Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court ruling came out saying exactly that, separate but equal is unconstitutional. Um, and Pauli's law professors had been inv were, were involved in that case. Uh, Spotswood Robinson, who was Pauli's professor at Howard, uh, Thurgood Marshall, also teaching at Howard, like all the great civil rights uh, you know, I icons were very much circling around Howard University. And in fact, Pauli's paper was used in developing the arguments that went into the Brown versus Board of Education brief. There's sort of specific points that Pauli makes that actually find their way into the formal brief and then into the Supreme Court ruling. I want to turn to an audio clip of Pauli Murray speaking in 1966 at the Harvard Law Forum. Nature does not ask us where she distributes brains, intellect, talent, drive. She simply scatters these with the recombination of the genes. Uh, in some ways, I might have been disadvantaged to have been born a Negro in white America, a woman in a man's profession, left-handed in a right-handed world, and I might throw in even an orphan at an early age. But there were, certain dis there were certain advantages in this status, which I didn't see then, but I see in retrospect. I therefore came to sex discrimination much later than I came to race discrimination. And having fought the battle of race discrimination, I began to see how integrally these two discriminations were. Since I could not split myself, and since I had to be a unified human being, I decided that it was not I that was wrong, but the society that was wrong. And that any time a society penalizes an individual because of a biological attribute, whether it be race per se, or whether it be sex per se, that society is going to be challenged. So that was Pauli Murray speaking at a Harvard Law Forum. Pauli Murray went to Howard Law School. Uh, in the 40s, Pauli Murray wrote a letter to Harvard Law School after being rejected for a further degree. At the time, the school only accepted men. Pauli wrote, quote, 
I would gladly change my sex to meet your requirements, but since the way to such change has not been revealed to me, I have no recourse but to appeal to you to change your minds. Now, this is not a minor point. She is prevented from going to Harvard Law School because of um, uh, they said they would not accept women to Harvard Law School. She would go to the University of California, Berkeley, then get another degree at Yale. Now a building is named uh, for Pauli Murray, the first African American uh, named on a building. A building is named for um, Betsy West. If you could talk about a lot of what's embedded in what she's in what Polly Murray is saying. Now, Polly Murray at the time referred to herself as she, um, but this is at a time when she had asked for testosterone treatment. Um, when um, they had asked for testosterone treatment, um, when they were asking doctors, could it be that in fact I am male? Uh, when there was an appendix problem, begging the doctor to do exploratory surgery to see if perhaps um, they had male genitalia inside. Yeah, um, as you said, uh, this was a this was a struggle that Polly went through privately. Um, you know, Polly wrote about civil rights women's rights, her fight for those things. But at the same time, as a young woman, Polly was experiencing the feelings, hey, I'm a man. And in, in Polly's 30s and 40s, consulting a series of doctors, uh, it was really extraordinary to read the letters that are in the Schlesinger Library at Harvard, where Polly's archive resides. Uh, in a folder that Polly saved for posterity to read, uh, her struggle to find an answer to the feelings that, that Polly had at the time. I mean, you have to remember, in the 1930s and 1940s, uh, there were no, there was no language. There were no words to describe the feelings that Polly had had from the time that she was a little girl. Um, and something that, uh, you know, was, a, was a, a private struggle that now, thanks to her saving all of this, we know about. And I think, um, you know, many people in the trans community will hear about have, have identified uh, with very strongly. We talked to, you heard from Dolores earlier, look forward to hearing from from Dolores and, now. And I want to bring Dolores into this conversation now. Dolores Chandler, um, you were the um, uh, project coordinator at the uh, Pauli Murray Project in Durham. I wanted to read a quote to you from another person featured in the film, the well-known attorney who we just had on this week from the ACLU, Chase Strangio, who tweeted, I hope everyone gets to learn about Pauli Murray, one of my heroes. I also think it's wrong to refer to Pauli with she, her pronouns. I hope we move away from that. We owe Pauli the respect to hold the capaciousness of Pauli's experiences in the world. Dolores, talk about how you learned about Pauli Murray, uh, your feelings at the time, not having grown up with her as, uh, as <laughs> here I use the term her, because she herself um, earlier. But in this day and age, as Chase Strangio says, do not use those pronouns. Your thoughts? Um, well, so to go back to how I learned about Polly Murray, I, you know, was really introduced um, to who Polly Murray is and was um, in 2013 when I uh, learned about the Polly Murray Project. And I think that there, for me, as I mentioned in the documentary, there was a real clear moment of recognition in the sense that here was this person who, um, and I think that, you know, 
Raquel Willis really uses the the perfect word, uh, expansive. Here's this person who is so expansive in their in their being, not just in terms of gender, but in terms of every um, a person who's become so integral in every almost every aspect of um, our culture and to to recognize somebody who is holding a sense of turmoil around uh, something that is very integral to their being. And what Polly talks about is the the necessity to be a um, to not frag- fragment themselves and to be in- integral or integrated into body, mind, and spirit. And so I think the ask to refer to Polly with um, gender neutral per- pronouns, as opposed to with she, her pronouns is to, is an ask to acknowledge the complexity and the fullness and expansiveness of who Polly was as a person. And talk so, about your thoughts, Dolores, uh, when, and your feelings when you first learned about Polly Murray, how you came uh, to be at the time the uh, coordinator, uh, project coordinator at the Polly Murray Project in Durham, North Carolina. So I uh, came to be in that position really through my um, field internship. I was in a social work program at UNC at the time, and I had been invited to participate in a weekend-long um, sort of discussion where there were people from uh, disciplines relevant to Polly Murray's life. So I was in, spent the weekend with lawyers and, uh, and priests and theologians. And I also was showing up not just as a social worker, but as a community organizer and performer. And we were all talking about the impact that Polly Murray had had on our lives and on our fields and our disciplines. And I think that I, for the first time ever was introduced to this person who not once um, ever really compromised who they were in order to achieve what they were trying to achieve in the world. And I think that when you're someone, you know, in my social work program, I was at the time the only um, out gender nonconforming, also queer person of color, um, in the program. And so when you're the only one of your kind in a space, it is a very isolating and lonely experience. And to then encounter someone like Polly Murray and to recognize that there were people like me and people like us who have come before us, but because of the way our society is constructed, our presence and our identities and the wholeness of who we are is often um, treated as either irrelevant or um, lacking in value. We trans and gender nonconforming folks are forced to sort of, in a lot of ways, navigate this world with the belief that we're an aberration or an anomaly or don't actually make uh, significant contributions to culture, to society, or to, to policies. And then to turn around and find this person who experienced a similar turmoil I th- I thought to myself, oh, this is a lie. Like the to be treated as though uh, trans people don't exist, or that trans people or gender nonconforming or non-binary people are a problem, or that um, their contributions are of of value only in so far as. Uh, we brush aside or we don't talk about those parts of that person that make us really uncomfortable or that we don't understand is um, forces that fragmentation and ultimately is a is a violence. So when I learned about Polly Murray, I if I could have, you know, if that had been an in-person meeting, I would have just fully embraced Polly and and hugged Polly so tightly to myself because, that was a life-giving moment for me. 
We spend the hour looking at a person written out of history books, but was so pivotal in the history of the struggle for equal rights in this country. Pauli Murray, the trailblazing black queer feminist poet, lawyer and legal scholar and priest who influenced landmark civil rights decisions and gender equality legislation that transformed our world. Late in life, after being a tenured professor at Brandeis University, Pauli Murray became a priest in the Episcopal Church, now considered a saint. This is Episcopal Bishop Michael Curry speaking about Murray's legacy in the fight for civil rights. Long before, almost 10 years before, Rosa Parks sat down and refused to give up her seat on that bus in Montgomery, Alabama. Pauli Murray sat down on a bus and refused to give up her seat, refusing to sit in the segregated section. She anticipated movements that would come years later. She sowed the seeds for change that would eventually happen. It was Pauli Murray who produced the seminal study of segregation laws throughout the United States that formed much of the basis for the legal work of Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP Legal Defense Fund that went into the case of Brown versus Board of Education. Pauli Murray did most of that legal research on civil rights, on segregation laws that needed to be overturned. That was Pauli Murray. She anticipated change that would impact both civil rights, but women's rights, and eventually LGBTQ rights. She anticipated all of those things in her legal work, in her legal writings. Her friendship with the late Eleanor Roosevelt was a friendship that was built on a mutual commitment to values of a humane and a decent world. She worked assiduously for that kind of world, even though she herself did not actually see it. She wrote and worked for the equality of women and for equity. In fact, there's a new uh, uh, commentary, a new article I saw the other day that has Ruth Bader Ginsburg referring to Pauli Murray as one of her heroines, if you will, in the struggle and in the work. She's an unsung hero for the rights and the equity of women an unsung hero for the rights and the equality and equity of all people in this country, an unsung hero for the rights of LGBTQ people in this country. She anticipated it. She saw it before it happened, and she worked for something that she would never see, but she did it so that some of us might actually see it. That's Bishop Michael Curry, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, talking about Pauli Murray. Bishop uh, Curry became global when he uh, gave the sermon at the royal wedding of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. This is Democracy Now!, as we continue with the directors of the new film, My Name is Pauli Murray. Julie Cohen and Betsy West. Their new documentary premiering at Sundance Film Festival this weekend, and we're joined by one of the subjects in the film about Pauli Murray, uh, Dolores Chancellor, who uh, is featured in that documentary, former coordinator of the Pauli Murray Center in Durham, North Carolina, now a social worker and equity facilitator and trainer. Uh, Julie, um, the life trajectory of Pauli Murray, it, it is just absolutely incredible, and incredible that we, unless in different worlds, closer um, uh, in those worlds, legal worlds, um, uh, uh, women's rights worlds, so many have not known about Pauli Murray. When Pauli Murray was rejected by Harvard for being a woman, they were doing that even though FDR the president of the United States wrote a letter to Harvard to say that Pauli Murray should be accepted. Pauli Murray was a friend of Eleanor Roosevelt, who sent flowers to Pauli Murray um, when they graduated from Howard Law School. Uh, not only was um, 
Pauli Murray a professor at Brandeis, but she also lived in Ghana. If you can just talk about that part of the trajectory and then deciding to become an Episcopal priest in the later years. Yeah, there is so much to this trajectory that it's, um, as, as you're seeing, hard to fit into a segment of a show, hard to fit into a film, every single chapter more fascinating than the last. Um, Polly was motivated to, um, to move, to, to, to uproot and move to Ghana uh, in the late 1950s. At the time, Polly was working as an associate at the prestigious New York law firm Paul Weiss. Um, a period of life where, for the first time, despite making so many contributions, often Polly was struggling um, to have enough money to pay the rent. Um, and uh, finally, at Paul Weiss, was making a, a great living, not feeling hugely fulfilled by the work, but certainly um, was intellectually engaged. Um, and then in 1959, um, a man named Mac Parker was lynched in Mississippi. Um, a big national news story at the time um, that there would be, you know, this this brutal lynching as late as 1959, and it just shook Pauli's world, um, and that led to the thought of, you know, what I, I not only I want to change my career path, but like I actually want to get out of the country for a while. Uh, Pauli took up an offer to go to the forming new law school in Accra, Ghana, um, and uh, was there for 18 months uh, teaching constitutional law concepts to uh, African law students, uh, ran into some trouble with the not so interested in constitutional democratic principles uh, government of, of Ghana at the time and decided it would be safer to come back to America. That was the period when Pauli got a doctorate at Yale Law School. Um, and as you say, well, uh, moved into moved into academics. Um, we're leaving out of this. Like every time I say something, I think of a chapter that we're not mentioning of all of all the accomplishments we talked about. Pa Pauli was out, also uh, an un unbelievable uh, published writer of both memoirs and poetry. Um, and uh, uh, after becoming a tenured professor at Brandeis, as you say, made the decision that at the core of everything Pauli had fought for through life, um, you know, the activist struggles and the legal struggles, maybe politics and law weren't the best way to achieve the huge monumental societal, societal shifts that Pauli and others in the movement were seeking. And maybe spirituality and, and God were the answers. And that's what led Pauli to divinity school at a time when women, and remember that Pauli was identifying in the world as a woman at the time, at the, at the time Pauli started divinity school, um, the Episcopal Church was not ordaining woman, women. Fortunately, um, by the time uh, that Pauli got the, got the degree, uh, Pauli was in fact ordained as, as, as an Episcopal priest. Um, and those who knew her, we interview or kn knew Pauli, we interview Pauli's grandniece in, in the film saying that becoming a priest really shifted Pauli's perspective and really turned Pauli from a talker to a listener and, you know, mellowed, mellowed Pauli, but not in a way that quieted Pauli, but in the way, a way, a, 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 like an, a, a mellowed activist. And through all of this period, I mean, the decades, what's so astounding at how much Pauli Murray accomplished, an amazing memoirist, journaler, as you said, poet, um, was institutionalized, would get depressed, had relationships when they ended uh, with women, uh, uh, fell apart. Can you talk about overcoming all of this? You know, Polly. You know, ha go ahead. Sorry, <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead, Julie. Sorry. Um, you know, it, it was really the spirituality that helped Polly overcome, um, over overcome loss and and struggle, and and I think that's where um, it was after the death of a 15-year partner, uh, Irene Barlow, that, that Pauli went to, went to Divinity School and found 
um, in the church solace from some of the lifelong struggle. And Betsy, you wanted to add, and the yeah, issue I mean, of institution being institutionalized, and also understanding um, um, their just talking to medical doctors all through this period. You can only imagine how incredibly uh, frustrating and difficult it was for Polly to have uh, this strong feeling of being a man and not getting any kind of validation for this. And yes, Polly was in and out of institutions suffering breakdowns, basically, in the 1930s and into the 40s. Eventually, uh, Polly did find this love relationship with Irene Barlow, which, as Julie said, lasted for 15 years. And, and I think that was a great solace for Polly. I also think that the move, uh, Polly had always been religious, had gone to the Episcopal Church, had always had found, actually, the relationship with our Irene. They shared uh, a, a passion for religion, used to go to church together. I also think that um, it gave Polly space to devote herself to uh, Polly's autobiography, which she spent the last few years, Polly's life, writing very seriously. Uh, at one In one interview, we heard Polly was introduced as a... Uh, lawyer turned poet. She said, no, I'm a poet turned lawyer. For Polly, writing was probably the most important uh, form of expression. Polly had written an amazing family memoir, Proud Shoes, which is kind of like the, uh, the precursor to Roots, an extraordinary story of, of her own family, mainly in the 19th century and then went on to finish her autobiography, which was extremely important to Polly.